Hello and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Arundhati Ramnin and with me as always is Shruti Mishra. These are the top headlines from the startup world. Tata and Zomato-backed Cult.Fit is working out to float its IPO in the next 12 to 18 months. A senior executive of the fitness startup told CNBC TV18, with the fitness industry returning to normalcy after the COVID slump, the company says its core gym business has turned operationally profitable. Baby and mother care brand Mother's Push says it is in advanced talks for Series B funding of 90 to 100 crore rupees with FMCG major ITC infusing 13.5 crore rupees. With this, ITC will increase its stake in the startup to 22% from 16% currently. Walmart-backed PhonePay doubles its revenue to over 1,600 crore rupees in FY22, while losses without ESOP costs contract marginally to 670 crore rupees over the same period. The payments player spent half its revenue, 800 crore rupees, on marketing. Financial planning and decision-making platform Drivetrain raises $15 million in funding from Elevation Capital, Jungle Ventures and Venture Highway. The AI-based SaaS startup was co-founded by Alok Goel, a former partner at VC firm Elevation Capital. Netflix stops losing customers, adds 2.4 million watchers globally in the September quarter after seeing its subscriber base shrinking in the first half of the year. The news also comes after the streaming giant launched a cheaper plan but with ads. Apple cuts production of iPhone 14 Plus within weeks of starting shipment as it re-evaluates demand. According to a report by The Information, Apple has asked a manufacturer in China to immediately halt production of iPhone 14 Plus components, according to the report. Well, those are the headlines we are tracking for you this evening. On the hot seat today, we put the spotlight on Go Pizza, a Korea headquartered pizza brand known for its one person oval shaped fire baked pizza. The venture recently raised $25 million in its Series C funding round and will use the fresh capital for aggressive expansion in India, backed by New Age Robotic and AI Technologies. To elaborate on these plans, joining me now are Jay Won Lim, founder and CEO of Go Pizza, and its India CEO, Mahesh. Ready, gentlemen. Welcome to Startup Street. And Jay, let me start with you. In 2016, you started serving one-person-sized pizzas from a food truck on the premise that pizzas could be inexpensive and eaten by an individual alone. Now, spurred by the popularity of these oval-shaped pizzas, you established your first outlet in South Korea in 2017. And since then, Go Pizza has seen explosive growth in five countries with over 160 stores. Take me through the current business growth numbers and how's the journey been like for you? Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be, you know, on this channel uh, live. Uh, it's 10 p.m. in Korea. So hello from Seoul. Um, so the business, uh, I started this business in 2016 on a one food truck. Um, and after that, uh, we started our first uh, store in Gangnam in 2017, you know, the Gangnam style. So we, after the first store took off, um, we were growing at a very rapid speed. Every year from 2018, we were uh, seed funded from 2018. And ever since we were funded every year and we were growing at least 2X to 10X um, every single year. So now we have um, 160 stores, as you mentioned. Uh, we, have, we are present in five different countries, including Korea, Singapore, India, Indonesia, and Hong Kong. Um, and now we just closed our Series C uh, as, a, as we speak. And the fresh capital will majorly go into India uh, because we see India as our biggest uh, potential market. Launch Go Pizza in Bengaluru in India in 2019. How big is India an opportunity for you and how has the market response been so far? What kind of revenues are you expecting from India? Well, yeah, I'm, you know, completely foreign. Um, and when we first went to India, everything was new. Everything was um, dif uh, difficult for us. Uh, but we've been um, patient and we've been quite stubborn with the potential. We, we saw the potential of the Indian market and we've been investing even um, during the COVID times. So now um, we have 15 stores running in Bangalore. Uh, we have 10 more coming up by this year. So there'll be 25 stores in just in Bangalore by this year. Uh, we're expecting around 100 stores uh, by next year. So we're expanding really quickly. Um, the market response has been um, great ever since the uh, the lockdown has been lifted. So since last year, June to July, uh, they, the sales has been growing. So we're growing at least six to ten times um, bigger than compared to last year. Hmm. Um, so now we're doing you know steady sales on every store. Every store is profitable. 
Um, and to be honest, I think uh, India is a billion dollar billion dollar revenue market for us. Mm -hmm. um, but for for now, like next year's plan, well, we plan to hit 10 million USD uh, okay. in terms of revenue just in the India market. With, All right. Um, more than you know, 80 to 100 stores. All right, all right. A huge room for growth. Uh, Mahesh, let me come to you quickly now. You plan to use the funds to fuel expansion plans in India. You know, like Jay mentioned, 15 outlets uh, already in India, and you're about to open 100 outlets by next year. You're opening a store in Hyderabad next month. If you could elaborate on India plans, and also, will these stores be a standalone restaurant, or will you also look at uh, doing only QSR? And what is the model? Are the stores going to be company-owned, or are you looking at a franchisee route? Uh, great. In India, we will be all company-owned outlets. Okay. Presently, we have 15 outlets. We'll be having 10 outlets in this quarter. Hmm. We'll be entering Hyderabad, Chennai, and we'll concentrate in the southern market for Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and Kerala for this quarter. For the next quarter, we'll be entering into western market where Mumbai, Pune, Ahmedabad, hmm. and followed by north and west in the balance quarters. Uh, presently, uh, we will end up this year with 25 outlets. We'll open 20 outlets per quarter, and that will that comes to six outlets per uh, per month. And we will be opening in all types of verticals. At, at Bangalore, we have experimented in different verticals like malls, airports, okay. uh, highways, and high street. And the same formats will be across India. And the potential and the growth which are shown in Bangalore has given us the confidence to go sure. to all the cities across India. Okay. Jay, let me come back to you. Go Pizza is known for its one-person oval-shaped fire-baked pizza, like I mentioned earlier. I believe you have plans to introduce your patented in-house technology in India, while the Govin, which is an automatic pizza oven, is already here. You plan to bring about GoBot, which is a cooperative robot, and the AI smart topping table to ensure timely, standardized you know, quality and services to customers at all your outlets in India. If you could elaborate on each of these offerings and the impact you hope to create. Well, you know, if I want to elaborate, I need two hours from your show. <laughs> but if Very I quickly. want to put it um, simply, so basically, you know, franchising business is all about scalability. So while you scale quickly, it's very important for you to uh, maintain that standard quality across all stores across different countries. So basically what AI Smart Topping Table does is it tracks and monitors the accuracy of every cruise topping so that we can even score you know every pizza and every cruise accuracy of the topping real time you know across the world just from uh, korea hq so with that technology we can ensure that every uh, customer is getting the same pizza and we can find out what went wrong with some uh with complaints and um, this dissatisfied customers and for gobot and govins uh, they basically help humans to make pizza faster and easier so that's why we can have stores with just one or two staffs who can make pizza within three to five minutes. So we are like McDonald's. So we sell pizza, but pizza okay. comes out in five minutes. Hmm. You know, our pizza starts from 99 rupees and we don't need many staffs. Hmm. So our verticals can be small, it could be big, it's very flexible and it's a very um, economic downturn proof. Basically it's recession proof uh, because it's very light model. All right. So, you know, as Mayesh mentioned, we could be in highways, we could be in shopping malls, we could be in airport, we could be anywhere. So we call ourselves sure. the pizza everywhere company. Okay. One final question, Mahesh, for you. And if you could quickly answer that, how competitively have you priced your offerings, especially as India is a price sensitive market? Yes, India is a price sensitive. Go Pizza has got four USP and mm. that's different. That is space, size, speed, speed and size. Mm. With this USP, uh, you'll be surprised our pizzas are affordable at less than a dollar and less than even a coffee price. We believe in pizza for one, pizza for everyone. And every city, every vertical will have a different pricing strategy as per the consumer demand. And that's what pizza for everyone. And you'll see the outlets from Jammu to Kanyakumari across everywhere. All right. And we wish you both the very best. Many thanks, Jay and Mahesh, for joining us on Startup Street today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on that note, document infrastructure startup Legality raised $5 million in a Series A round led by IIFL Fintech Fund and existing investor Mumbai Angels. This also marks IIFL Fintech Fund's second investment in the firm. 
Founded in 2016, Legality's e-sign, e-stamp and document workflow platform enabled Indian businesses to sign and manage their paperwork with customers and other stakeholders in a faster, easier and more legally compliant way. Now, the startup will use the capital to accelerate customer acquisition, invest in product development and rapidly enhance customer experience. Joining us now to discuss this further is Shivam Singla, the founder of Legality. Shivam, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You essentially enable Indian businesses to digitally transfer their document logistics. Take me through the pain point you're trying to solve. What's the growth been like for you so far? Right, right. So first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, I think at Legality, we've been working with a vision that within the next five years, uh, Legality becomes the standard way how documents are executed in India and physical documentation becomes an exception, right? Because when you look across the length and breadth of the economy, most formal business relationships are built on documents, yet processes around document documents are paper-driven and uh, archaic, right? Uh, so uh, to solve for this uh, through legality, through, through a document infrastructure platform, we enable Indian businesses to be able to completely digitize and automate the processes around document logistics with a compliance first approach and with a compliance first and deeply localized approach, right? And since 2020, we've grown around uh, 13 times and we're looking to again grow uh, more than three, four times in the next 18 months. Right, I'm going to come back and ask you more about uh, the growth story there as well. But you've right. raised uh, $5 million. Uh, tell me how you plan to use these funds. What's on top of the agenda? Right. So while uh, Legality has been a cash flow positive con company since 2020, uh, 2020 itself, uh, we think this fundraise will uh, make us even more fearless and confident in trying to significantly ramp up our customer acquisition and enabling us to focus our product and strategy on certain uh, key sub-segments within the market, especially in the BFSI space. All right, especially in the BFSI space. Now, take me through the kind of products that you have on offer. And like you said, you're going to use the funds to invest in product development. So what's in the pipeline? What's next? Right. So uh, we are uh, looking at, with, with a lot of ecosystem changes happening, uh, in especially in the BFSI space. For example, recently the uh, RBI's digital lending guidelines have come in or recently, again, an IT amendment has come in with which allows a lot of documents in the BFSS space to be digitally enabled, right? So we are looking at all these use cases that are coming up in the market and looking at where the uh, uh, BFSS space is going in general and uh, carefully curating our products and hyper-tuning uh, them to solve for some of those needs, right? For example, uh, we have managed, within the last one year, we have managed to, uh, uh, Acquire a significant stake, a significant share in the uh, in the documents executed in the Indian MFI space, right? So similarly, right. we're looking at different segments and seeing what can be done and what do we need to do to actually solve for these problems and take the economy ahead. All right, and uh, so you have over about one thousand five hundred clients. Uh, what's the plan to grow this further? What's your client acquisition plan? And which sector are you seeing most of the traction from? I'm sure you cater to a bunch of sectors. You can take us through that. And where are you seeing most of the traction from? So uh, we think we have seen that uh, BFSI, uh, within BFSI is obviously right. the biggest market. Uh, we course. see for our products. And even within BFSI, we see lending as the biggest segment. right? And even if we look at the volume of documents across the economy, we think that even for, from our perspective, it makes sense to focus on that segment. Uh, so uh, BFS and lending, I would say, are the two segments that we uh, think are the most important to solve for. All right. And uh, you've seen your quarterly revenue, like you said, grow by over 13 times since 2020. Take me through the revenue picture. Where do you hope to close this year? And take us through your revenue model as well. Right. Uh, so we uh, charge on a dual model, right? At okay. the at the base, uh, in a so at the base we follow a horizontal model where anyone wanting to do digitize their documents can come and come on the legality website, create a uh, create an account and start using the product. But at the top of that, there is a, a more uh, enterprise focused product which is more sales driven, where uh, there is a dual model where there's an annual subscription fee based on the kind of features that you need, the kind of users that you need, how. Uh, how many workflows you need, for example, and then there is a transactional fee which is charged for per document. Right? So that's the business model. And as I said, we're looking to grow uh, the, the our numbers, both quarterly numbers and our client uh, numbers by three to four times in the next 18 months. 
All right. Also, uh, can you tell me what the expansion plans are? What's next for the company? How do you plan to grow your company further? What are the targets? Right. So I think uh, given that literally every business in the formal economy needs documentation for various processes, we think uh, that we we have seen that there is a really really large market, and right and there are a lot of sub segments within the market. So I think uh, right now we have not even scratched the surface. So our idea. Uh, and our focus for the next two years is to continue going deeper and deeper into the Indian economy and solve for more and more of use cases, look at more and more segments and both uh, grow our customer base within these segments and also explore new segments. But our focus for the next two years is entirely India. All right. So focus for the next two, uh, two years is entirely India. All right, Shivam, thank you so much for joining us on the show and we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot. On that note, it's time for us to head into a short break. Coming up on the other side, a sneak peek into the annual NASCOM product conclave, which showcases Indian products and startups that are transforming the world. More on the other side. Stay tuned. The annual NASCOM product conclave, which showcases Indian products and startups that are transforming the world, has kick-started. The event is now in its 19th edition and will see participation from over 2,000 software entrepreneurs, technology executives, digital business CXOs, academic researchers and investors. This year's theme is World Class from India and aptly so, given how India is playing a decisive role in tech innovation for the world. Talk to us about what is expected from this year's conclave, the innovation in deep tech, how India is building a world-class ecosystem and of course the Web3 startup landscape in India. Three very special guests, uh, Sangeeta Gupta, the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at NASCOM is with us. So is Anant Nagraj, the Co-Founder and CTO at Nani.ai and Jitendra Gupta, the Founder and CEO of Jupiter. Uh, Sangeeta and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I'll start with you, Sangeeta. Uh, if you could take us through some of the key findings of the report that NASCOM has launched and what the growth drivers are and where India stands in the Web3 ecosystem today. Thank you so much, Ritu, and it's such a pleasure to be back at the NASCOM product conclave. We're coming back in person after three years, and it's just amazing to see the energy of, you know, how the whole startup and product ecosystem has matured over this year. So uh, we're also using this opportunity to launch the NASCOM Web3 report, as you articulated. It's our first report that looks at the Web3 startup ecosystem in India, the opportunities, the challenges, the investment, the case studies, the different use cases that Web3 offers. And I think more importantly, articulates an important pitch that, you know, Web3 is an important technology and for India, the right regulatory and policy framework would be critical for India to build out so that, you know, India does not lag behind in this technology. What would you peg as a key challenges? Because the report also mentions that, you know, India's Web3 potential being one of the largest talent pools and whatnot is critically hamstrung by prohibitive regulations on one hand, which is also leading to talent and funding exodus. Uh, could you elaborate on that as well? So I think uh, the important point that the report is uh, calling out is that the regulation should not be about technology, right? You do not regulate a technology, you regulate a use case. So you should, you know, so if, if there are concerns around cryptocurrency, then the regulation is about currency, not about banning Web3 technologies from India. So I think that's the fundamental uh, approach that is being suggested that the government should look, a should look at a sandbox approach to innovation, where you look at different use cases and then say which policy regulations, what are the positives, what are the negative impacts, and then what should be the right regulatory framework so that technologies like Web3, which have multiple use cases in India, can really proliferate and not a one-size-fits-all approach. Anand, let me come to you for Nani. You know, from when you started that journey a few years ago to today, the startup ecosystem has matured. We have more than 100 unicorns. And as we look ahead, no doubt, innovation in deep tech will define the next generation products and services. So if you could tell us a bit about how the deep tech ecosystem has evolved in India in your journey and what are the big gaps and loopholes and what can we do to accelerate the growth of innovation in deep tech companies from India? Sure. Uh, typically, since the time we started Yanni to now, I would say there is a tectonic shift that has happened in the way the deep tech uh, ecosystem has evolved. Earlier, it was very few companies trying to build uh, on deep tech, but today you see a lot many companies attacking uh, deep tech across the space of language, vision, or space tech. 
And uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the unicorns today you see largely in B2B side, which are on SaaS, are companies which started probably a decade ago. And the next wave is going to be driven by these deep tech companies. The key challenges was initially was access to data. But India as a country today, we have, because of the large scale digitization, we have huge amount of data sets where uh, it actually becomes like a big playground for Indian companies to prove their model, to play around with this large data sets, uh, tune their, fine tune their models and then go global. So essentially the shift that has been there with us over the last say four or five years is extremely good for deep tech companies building out of India. One, accessibility to data, accessibility to resource and also to try out your data live. Essentially, with all of these deep tech problems, it is about proving the efficacy of your model. And a country like India helps you to solve multiple challenges that a deep tech company will face when they hit customers. Jitendra, we can't really talk about building world-class products in India without talking about fintech startups here. And you've seen it from both sides, right? With your two startups and now as an investor as well. We've made our mark in the world, but you know, what is the next next big opportunity in the making for fintechs? Are we on the cusp of something bigger with you know the increasing mobile and internet penetration? We have 5G, we have ONDC, we have the Jam Trinity and what not working in our favor. If, if you look at the India's uh, journey into the fintech ecosystem uh, in last five years specifically, like we had this whole Jam Trinity which completely opened up the space. So like so many number of accounts and the uh, open architecture around Aadhaar and the mobile penetration. I think that has completely changed the ecosystem uh, so far. And we have already seen uh, how UPI, like from nowhere in 2016, now contributes almost like 72% of retail payments. Like there's a massive number. Um, there's no single example across the world where a, a single payment method has gained so much uh, dominant market share within a span of five years, like Visa, MasterCard and all of that have taken like 50, 60 years to reach to that kind of market share. So I think that's uh, that's incredible. Now what's next in store, if you look at it, the way uh, uh, the Indian uh, financial services ecosystem is working, the, every, the, the rails on which the FinTech companies are building are completely open. So there's a complete open architecture around, like we recently heard about uh, ONDC, and then before that we, we, we heard about the OKEN where the open credit enabled network uh, uh, could be uh, would be available for any fintech company to start doing lending and there is a source of capital already being available so i think uh, all in all the the baseline of open architecture is what uh, fuel the growth in coming days or the coming uh, decade this decade and uh, personally i'm very very bullish on the uh, the scope of the financial services companies there's been a slew of regulations from the reserve bank of india whether it was the limited role of co-branding entities loading of credit line onto ppis all these new norms they really caused a lot of angst in the industry forcing some of them to abandon the growth at all cost approach and scramble to comply with these strict regulations are you worried about the regulators approach or do you think or like you said uh, it's just that at the end of it stronger players will emerge perhaps we'll see more consolidation so it's true that uh, the the last one year RBI has been uh, more proactive and nimble than startups as well. Uh, I would say that, and uh, and I think uh, in the nutshell, if you look at the spirit of those regulations, the spirit of those regulations are still centered around uh, how do you protect customer interest. So from that standpoint, I don't see anything wrong. Yes, uh, that there is a temporary disruption in the industry because certain regulations come without any timelines for change or they don't give timelines to uh, companies to evolve. Uh, so I think that is a dis real disruption I see. But all in all, if I have to take a very macro view and like step out from my day-to-day -day stuff, I think all in all, RBI is very focused on uh, protecting consumer interests. So, and this will bring in discipline around compliance, data privacy, and offering the right credit practices towards the consumers. So I think it was needed. Uh, whether this could have been more calibrated approach, maybe yes. But uh, whether this is wrong, definitely not. I think it's a very, very, it was very much needed as an approach from the regulator. All right, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Startup Street. More news and updates coming up on the other side. Stay tuned.